you. Good, af good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Anjali Ochreker, and I currently serve as the Acting U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator. And I'm just thrilled on behalf of our entire team, as well as our interagency colleagues, to welcome you all to today's PEPFAR Strategy Vision 2025 listening session. We've organized each listening session by stakeholder or constituency as listed here. And again, today we're thrilled to have our partner governments from finance as well as health join us today. The format of each listening session will include a brief presentation and overview, and then we'll have a facilitated panel of esteemed st stakeholders and colleagues um, followed by a moderated open session for all attendees to weigh in on comments and reflections. And finally, we'll have our rapporteur summarize key themes at the end. So moving into the epidemiologic and PEPFAR overview, here we see global, the global HIV AIDS situation with significant declines in new infections and deaths since 2003. We also see the global treatment cascade on the right. And just to note here that these collective successes are a result in large part of our truly collaborative relationship from across the many governments and countries here um, in our effort to scale prevention and treatment programs around the globe. Looking regionally, we see Eastern and Southern Africa with the most significant epidemiologic impacts as a result of controlled epidemics in many high burden countries. Here we see trends in new infections and deaths across the top, distribution of new infections by population on the bottom left, resource needs, and testing and treatment cascades as well as gaps. And we'll see similar um, documents or, or graphs for, for each region. In Western and Central Africa, Africa, we see continuing declines, as well as in Asia and the Pacific. Here we see concentrated new infections, but again, continuing declines. And in the Caribbean, we also see continuing declines. And in Latin America, we're seeing a relatively steady state. In Eastern Europe and Asia, we see increasing trends in new infections and deaths. What has remained consistent is the unwavering bipartisan congressional and presidential leadership and support of PEPFAR since its inception in 2003 to present day. And as you know, PEPFAR provides support in 55 countries and our investment is aligned to HIV burden of disease. Here we see a summary of PEPFAR's latest program global results. And again, all in partnership together with you. We have 18.2 million people on life-saving treatment, for example, and, and this is an additional 1 million in the past six months alone. We see a number of other key strides we've made together, whether it's in circumcision for orphans and vulnerable children or preventing new infections among adolescent girls, as well as other indicators. Here we see the trends over time of the PEPFAR budget in the blue line and the increasing results for circumcision in yellow and treatment in blue bars. And again, this just includes our latest results through two quarters, so we still have two more quarters to add. And our shared commitment to treatment continuity and growth is clear, despite the peaks in COVID-19, as depicted here in the peach. We're seeing significant progress across countries toward UNAIDS 95-95-95 goals. Here are select countries across Africa that have completed the population-based uh, survey, the FIAs, and results are depicted here, as well as community viral suppression in orange. 
We've made strides together preventing new infections among adolescent girls and young women through innovative public private partnerships like dreams, for example. And we've made progress together and still see gaps in our key population programming. We'll go quickly here, but, but wanting to really show with data a number of countries at epidemic control of HIV and a big thanks to UNAIDS for much of the data that is presented here. These countries are at epidemic control of HIV. We see Zimbabwe, Malawi, Kenya, Lesotho, and here, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Eswatini, Thailand, N Nepal, and Cambodia, Burundi, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, DRC, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Togo, Mali, Liberia, Trinidad, and Tobago. Again, all at epidemic control of HIV. We have another series of countries that are nearing epidemic control of HIV. And these include Botswana, Haiti, Uganda, Vietnam, Guatemala. And finally, we have a series of countries with declining new infections, but not yet at epidemic control of HIV. And these include Angola, Ghana, Mozambique, Nigeria, South Sudan, Ukraine, Tanzania, Zambia, and South Africa. And again, just to note that the Y axis is very different across countries here. Similarly, we have Tajikistan, Indonesia, Panama, Guyana, Jamaica, and the Dominican Republican Republic. Again, decreasing new, um, new infections, but not at epidemic control. Looking at gaps, opportunities, and the end state. Again, showcasing some really critical data coming, coming from UNAIDS in terms of distribution of new infections, as well as by age and sex. We really wanna make two points here. The first, in Sub-Saharan Africa, despite gains, as we've seen before, 52% of new infections are among 15 to 49 year old females, even though they only account for 24% of the population. We must together continue to decrease new infections in this population, particularly with the youth bulge across the continent. Second, there is significant variability of coverage and accessibility of critical HIV prevention services for key populations across countries and regions. So here, we must continue to focus on these populations and address barriers to their services. Here we see coverage in ART by adults and children over the last decade. And two points to make here. First, 40% of children living with HIV had suppressed viral loads in 2020 versus 67% of adults. And second, nearly two thirds of children not on treatment are among those aged five to 14 years old. So again, a need to focus here as well. COVID continues to be a vulnerability affecting the program and the beneficiaries that we're serving. We've been adapting the program together with you for the past 18 months to protect the gains and try and accelerate the gains in HIV while also helping to respond to COVID-19. And in large part, really doing this by leveraging the robust platform that exists around the globe across these countries that PEPFAR investments have he helped strengthen over time, including labs, healthcare facilities, um, healthcare workforce and community health workforce and, and commodities supply chain. Here we see HIV investments by funder in PEPFAR supported countries. In red is the PEPFAR contribution, blue, the global fund contribution, and gray, the domestic government contribution. In orange, we see other funders. Again, we're not in this alone and we all need to support one another as we look at the shared investment across across the portfolios and across the countries. Here we see projected gross domestic product growth versus HIV prevalence and economic problems that persist across the board in countries 
um, because of COVID-19, particularly in those with high HIV prevalence, as we see in the red dots, as well as high income um, status countries toward the right. One of the key components to our approach to sustainability is delivery of services through local partners and communities. This includes government to community um, and community led uh, organizations. Currently, we have 55% of new funds going directly to local partners in blue, as you can see across these three graphs. And this is the 55% in the leftmost graph. What we see is that it varies by country as well as by care and treatment, as you can see in the middle, as and prevention on the far right, where we have less than 40% of new funds going to local partners. So in the end, what does sustained response look like? There are several factors, including a whole of domestic approach from community to government, sufficient functional, technical, and managerial capacity to ensure continuity of services, financially sustaining essential services, HIV service delivery integrated into the broader public and private care delivery systems, robust public health response to monitor and track existing and emerging threats, as well as quality assurance to ensure positive health outcomes. With that backdrop, Moving to what brings us here today, the discussion around the five year PEPFAR's five year strategy and the development. We started developing the strategy with your help since fall of 2020 as bulleted here, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue with you and others and our, and our various other stakeholders through these listening sessions and more. These listening sessions that we're conducting this week and into next week will both feed into the strategy itself, as well as the country operational and regional operational planning for 22 guidance that we will be developing later this summer and into the fall, as well as longer term planning for the program as we move forward. The strategy is focused on achieving sustainable, equitable, and resilient control of HIV moving together to ensure support for global efforts to put countries on track to reach the SDG goal three, and also making sure we're closely coordinating with the global AIDS strategy 2021 to 2026, recently released by UNAIDS and adopted by the countries, as well as the post 2022 global fund strategy that is in progress. There are there are three proposed goals and a series of objectives. I won't read all of these as you've been given the these in PDF form, but just to go over the goals and pause on each slide so that everyone can take in the information. The proposed goal one is to accomplish the mission, 95, 95, 95, sustained, equitable, client-centered HIV prevention and treatment services with a series of six objectives listed here. Goal two is to build enduring capabilities, resilient and capacitated country health systems, communities, and local partners with five proposed objectives listed here. And finally, goal three is to broaden the base of support, partner for greater impact, burden sharing and sustainability with these five objectives listed here. Now I'd like to hand it over to, um, to our next session, which will be related to the panelists and hearing from, from, from them as well as we'll then open it up uh, to all attendees to reflect as well. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Keichi Achebe, followed by Mai Hajazi and Bill Paul, who will introduce the panelists and, and continue to facilitate um, this, this session. Over to you, Keichi. Thank you so much, Angeli. And um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining this session. 
And today I have the privilege of facilitating this panel with my two colleagues, as Anjali has mentioned, Mai Hijazi and Bill Paul. And um, we're privileged to really have a strong panel of key stakeholders at government partners from some of the countries where we implement our PEPFA programs. Our panel represents the breadth of our programs from Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Alicia Rob Allen from Jamaica, Dr. Rose Nyerenda from Malawi, Dr. Mark Bletcher from South Africa, Dr. Chiwanan from Thailand, Dr. Cordelia from Uganda, and Dr. Wali from Zambia. So we have a set of questions that we have provided to the panelists. And David, maybe if you can put it in the chat. And um, we going alphabetically by country, I'll ask each panelist to respond to a question. Well, however, please do feel free to respond to all or some of the other questions. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Alicia. And my question to you is, what does the PEPFA program look like at sustained epidemic control of HIV? What are the main threats to maintaining epidemic control of HIV? Over to you, Dr. Alicia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, everybody. Um, thanks for this opportunity. So. The first thing that I, I know PEPFAR has committed to is ensuring the alignment to the UNAIDS target so we will reach epidemic control. But when we look at things in terms of implementing at the country level, we have to look at the countries that we are implementing our programs in, or PEPFAR is implementing programs in. Where is the country at in terms of their epidemic? What are the policies that are in place that are going to aid in the us attaining the targets for epidemic control and what are the policies that exist that are not not in alignment that will aid in our achievement and then after looking at that we have to look at the health system that exists and utilizing that health system to ensure that we expand it improve it or tailor it so that it will be used towards getting epidemic control the cultural context of the country has to be put in play because even with the set objectives, if it is that we have a population that is not ready to, to look at or to move towards certain strategies, we have to figure out how do we ensure that we are aligned with the cultural context of the country or implement programs to spark behavior change as at the end of the day, this is something that will aid the country in the long run. There has to be an understanding that the countries that you implement programs are in, that there is the overlying global threat, that any shake in, if there's a pandemic, as we're seeing with COVID-19, in our small island states, if there is a hurricane or any political uprising, it is going to have an impact on service delivery of what is happening within a country. So you have to understand that there are vulnerabilities that exist and put systems in place so that we can address those vulnerabilities. In addition to that, we have to look at HIV as not just a chronic communicable disease, but also as a social disease. And that health, even though health is where we're targeting, we have to look at the social context that we are we're dealing with. Um, or within Jamaica, as I will use my country, the majority of our persons with HIV are, are socially challenged. They, they are poor. So we have to see how it is that we enable them to ensure that they get to, to epidemic control within their setting and enable them to become key participants in, in their life as, as well as in the response. Additionally, we have to recognize that even in attaining 95, 95, 95, that there is the challenge that we 
that we have to ensure that we sustain the response. So what have we implemented? What funding needs to be transferred to the government? What, what programs do we need to scale up, scale down, and then ensure that the, the government that would be the persons responsible for maintaining epidemic control are equipped to ensure this, this happens? And my last thing is, one thing that I, I have admired in terms of how PEPFAR has implemented programs within Jamaica, it's not just at the policy level, it's at every level, it's at service delivery, middle management, at the, the national level, so that it's not just about government to government, but a holistic approach impacting all levels. And when we look at all of those things, we have to ensure that there is a collaborative approach. And I see that as the main thing that will that is the main threat I see to to having a sustained HIV response. If we don't have a collaborative approach, the government alongside PEPFAR to ensure that we get to epidemic control, we have our things aligned with our country, country's policies, country's cultural context, and also looking at our sustainability and transition to sustainability so that we can maintain or epidemic control. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alicia. That was a um, very important uh, reflection that you have provided. Um, really collaborative approach is key. So I'm just going to turn it over to Rose and, um, you know, I'll go to the first question and say, you know, the PEPFAR strategy, Vision 2025, is aligned to the SGD, SDG as a global AIDS strategy. Are the draft PEPFAR strategy, which we have shared with you, the goals and objectives, the priority area for the program to address, are any missing or in need of refinement? Over to you. Thank you, Katie, for, um, uh, for, that, for that question. Uh, but also let me thank the whole paper team for giving Mara with the opportunity to participate in this panel. Uh, overall, the goals and objectives are comprehensive and uh, they address the broader areas uh, uh, regarding uh, the HIV response. However, uh, a sustained, equitable and people-centered HIV prevention and treatment interventions should be guided by evidence or should be driven by evidence, including modeling studies and other credible data sources that are generated locally. Uh, I think the, yes, the strategies have been driven by uh, evidence, but not all interventions that we have invested to have were evidence-based. So in country, I will give an example of Malawi. We have done a lot of modeling. We know which uh, interventions would give us the most impact. Uh, we've looked at that is effectiveness and efficiency. So uh, we believe that this money should be invested in those areas that are going to give us the most impact and are evidence-based. And we should deprioritize those that are not going to give us the impact. So, Probably the, the strategy should be evidence driven. I think that should come out here. Um, I'll give an ex examples of uh, interventions like PrEP, like TPT, like the HYW interventions. These have not been ind independently evaluated. So as we move forward, we need to uh, even evaluate some of these interventions. I think for now, injectable. PrEP is a very promising uh, intervention, which I think can uh, impact posit positively on uh, uh, issues of adolescent girls and young women, uh, only if we lobby for reduced prices. So um, yes, evidence pricing we can consider, but we know that through PEPFAR, the advocates role can also be played because this is one of the impactful interventions if we implement it, the injectable PrEP. Uh, the second factor, which I think my colleague from uh, uh, my colleague, uh, the previous speaker, just uh, alluded to, I think there is needed to consider local context, but also alignment of the strategies 
to how the government visualizes what a sustainable and equitable resilient uh, 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 epidemic uh, uh, outlook will be. What I'm trying to say is the strategy should be should be as broad as possible, but also make sure that it it um, incorporates the local context. Countries should be able to look at the local context and identify priori priorities that could be implemented using the local context. But also, how does the government visualize uh, a sustainable, equitable, and resilient control of the HIV epidemic? I think those. Um, should be considered or should be incorporated. And in terms of the government's visualization, it also includes the social determinants. So what are the social determinants that, that are also driving the epidemic? So I think those components should be inc incorporated. Uh, there's also a mention, I think the, what I've seen is that uh, the global strategy, uh, HIV strategy, but also the, um, yeah, the global strategy is focusing on uh, moving towards strengthening community systems, which is good uh, because it is obviously going to fill the gaps where countries have uh, have not done well. So that investment is going to fill those gaps for hard to reach areas and marginalized populations. However, uh, whilst we invest in community systems, we also need to um, invest make sure that the community systems that we are investing are in synergy with the government led systems to make sure that uh, uh, within the community systems the district capacity which leads the epidemic uh, 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 control decisions is part of, of the uh, capacitation uh, because community systems cannot function alone without leadership within that district uh, uh, perspective but also as we invest in local partners, uh, we should make sure that they do not substitute government-led systems. Because once the resources are not available for local partners like NGOs, then you go back to uh, 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 a system whereby uh, uh, whatever was invested could not be sustained because at that point, government may have challenges to take it up. Uh, but also there are, we know there are opportunities for public private partnership so uh, that is an area where ngos could also come in but obviously also that has cost implications which they, therefore government can either take up what the uh, ngos were implementing or they may not that's why uh, we are saying that local partners should not substitute government and also um the issue of uh, uh, investment in, uh, I think we are key populations uh, have been, have come out in most of these strategies and the way they are defined they may not be actually the way, uh, they may not be defined as the drivers of infections in every country. So the definition of key population should be, can also be localized to include other populations which do not fit in this grouping but are also the drivers of infection so that investment may not just be uh, prioritized for those key, but all those populations that drive the infection. So I think here we should allow for also definition of key population within the local context, uh, because then that will drive where the investment goes into. And also uh, I'm excited that the, the issue of leveraging uh, the very best of American capacity uh, um, it could be research, but also other interventions. I think we should make sure that there is pairing with Malawian institutions or local institutions to make sure that uh, there is that capacity built for, uh, 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 for the law as we sustain the epidemic control. I'll just quickly touch on the second question, which was about threats. What are the main threats to maintaining epidemic control of HIV? I think if we are to reduce funding, or investment towards priority health system strengthening, that would be a major threat uh, that could uh, take us back uh, in terms of uh, 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 a research of the uh, epidemic. But also as Malawi, for example, we have a very strong M&E system. And this is something that we have learned that for any disease control, including even COVID, if you don't have a strong M&E system, 
you cannot achieve uh, uh, the, your goals. So this is an area that if not invested, um, it can be a threat. Integrated service delivery, whereby we integrate uh, across diseases uh, in terms of service delivery, that is also important. Um, for example, we have already seen COVID-19 platforms being used for HIV, but we also need to bring in sexual reproductive health, maternal and child health, NCDs. Uh, as our people living with HIV are aging and are living longer, the issue of non-communicable diseases will come in. So investment in an, in an integrated service delivery system is very key. If not, that may be a threat in terms of maintaining epidemic control. But also as we move towards community systems, that should, we need to consider uh, investment in infrastructure. If we can just threat, strengthen the community-led systems or the community health systems without incorporating infrastructure at the community level, that can also be a threat. Uh, for example, if you want to bring condoms to the last mile uh, at community level, where do you store them? So again, looking broadly at issues of uh, uh, investment at community level or for community health systems, uh, if that investment is not there, that can also be a threat to maintaining um, epidemic control. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. A lot of uh, food for thought, and I think a real good segue to the next question. You know, you talked about integrating service delivery systems as. Um, if we don't invest in that, it could serve as a threat. So I would move then to Mac. I think that's a nice segue for the question I have for you on COVID. So PEPFAR continues to achieve progress, but COVID has short and long term effects. How should PEPFAR plan over the next five years to mitigate the effects of COVID? and accelerate towards reaching sustainable, equitable, and resilient epidemic control? How should PEPFA continue to leverage its platform for broader health outcomes? Mark, please can you take that on? Um, somebody can't hear me there? Hi, can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Um, good morning or good afternoon, uh, colleagues from all of these interesting countries around the world. Um, and uh, hi, Alicia. So my, uh, my name is Mark Bletcher. Um, I work in the Ministry of Finance, the National Treasury in South Africa, where I head the section dealing with health and social services. Um, and I, I've worked on HIV for many, many years. Um, but I mean, literally the last 18 months of COVID has been, I mean, it's been back to the worst days of HIV AIDS. I mean, when when the when there was like the funerals every weekend for HIV AIDS, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. I mean, this last year has been really, I mean, it's like something we haven't seen for a very, very long time. And, you know, when I look at the, I mean, so I mean um in the last two weeks, for example, um South Africans uh, statistics agency has put out the recent death data in terms of also, for example, life expectancy. And I think life expectancy in South Africa in these graphs, I mean, the, the graph, which has been growing, I mean, it was last low with HIV AIDS in 2006, and it's dropped to the same extent, you know, now in this last year. And I was looking also at the life expectancy uh, uh, graph that um, CDC put out for the US also in the last few weeks. And I mean, it's, it's it's come down not as much as South Africa, but I mean, you, it's really interesting to see that life expectancy graph in the US drop. So, I mean, I just think, you know, I mean, I, I thought I would never again in my lifetime see anything like HIV again. And now COVID is massive like that. And it doesn't seem to be going away, you know, soon now with all, you know, I mean, we, we've been we deep in our third wave. And I mean, people are starting to, of course, talk now whether booster doses are needed and this, that, the other. And, um, you know, there's outbreaks, uh, breakthrough infections and this, that, the other. So, I mean, I think the this question about how to bring, you know, how does COVID and HIV, how do they, they interrelate? I, I mean, I suppose to some extent it's on you know, everybody's minds. But to, to, to my mind, after having worked on both of these for a long time, 
I mean, I mean, COVID is really big now. I mean, it's massive. It's it's really affecting our lives. I mean, I'm still sitting 14 months at home at, at home today. I'm not even in my normal office. You know, it's like it's just completely changed our whole lives, really. And because of that, also, there's a lot of international collaboration and support around COVID. So the question comes then. I mean, for example, South Africa has just got just got five million doses of of, PEP, of 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 Pfizer vaccine as a donation, for example, from the U.S. government. South Africa just got like, uh, uh, you know, like um, ten days ago. So, I mean, the question is: is should there be two totally separate programs? One HIV program going through PEPFAR and a totally separate um, COVID program. Given the massive size that that COVID is at the moment, and I'm, I mean, my sense is that you know, given that they do both two such massive issues, they're both in the infectious disease space. There's so many kind of common aspects of them. My my sense is that over the next year or two, it would be easier to kind of bring them together, and so kind of bring them together, run them almost together, almost as one program or one program with subsections, or something like that. Um, the second implication that I want to just just raise is that I mean South Africa is an upper middle income country, and so we shouldn't really be particularly dependent on a funder like PEPFAR. Um, but I mean the South African economy has near collapsed with COVID. I mean our, our economy dropped by seven to eight percent last year. Our tax revenue base dropped by three hundred billion rand. And that, although we put 20 billion into the health department last year for COVID in 2020, because the fiscus has collapsed, tax revenue has collapsed, our health budget has been cut by 76 billion rand. That's a, let's just say seven billion dollars. Our public health budget has been cut by seven billion dollars over the next three years. So that's massive. Our domestic funding for health is, is facing a massive cut. And so the whole funding landscape as it pertains to PEPFAR and the collaboration with PEPFAR is also entirely different because our ability to replace PEPFAR funding is 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 um, in a kind of transition, handout transition has completely changed. Um, I mean, just for example, in the lives versus livelihoods debates, I mean, we lost 3 million jobs through COVID. We've have to had, we've had to put um, 100 million a year into extra social grants. We've had to create new social grants. Um, you know, there are millions of people who are unemployed, homeless, on the streets, um, people who can't eat. You know, I mean, we it's really kind of um, a cross-cutting, like, massive issue. Um, and it's massively affecting the health budget, and that massively affects our interrelationship with bodies like PEPFAR or the Global Fund, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think things just can't be the same, really. And then, of course, you get the whole issue about the way COVID has, has so disrupted the platforms for service delivery for HIV. So that, you know, there's been millions of people who've, who've, who've gone off treatment and not, have not come into treatment, who's supposed to have been getting ARV treatment. And so, you know, COVID has massively disrupted HIV and TB. So I think what I'm saying is, I, I don't know the answers to this, but it just seems to me that, both COVID and HIV are massive at the moment, and it might be better to bring them together and try and tackle these two massive problems together. Um, yeah, so I don't know the answers, but to me, these are two massive problems, and it's probably easier to bring them together at the moment and talk, you know, deal with both of them when we're talking to you guys at the same time. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mark. That is, um, you know, yeah, we we have seen the impacts of COVID um, all over the globe, and it's definitely something for us to think about. About you know how do we um, how do we leverage the Pepfer platform to um, support both COVID, HIV, TB, and other programs. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chiwanan and move into the other side of the world, to Thailand, and I will just ask you. Um, what does the PEPFAR program look like at sustained epidemic control of HIV? And what are the main threats to maintaining epidemic control of HIV? Your reflections, thank you. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, colleague. 
we think that the country where are uh, at or near epidemic control far choose invest more on health system level more than the site level. The investment can focus on the building technical staff capacity at provincial and regional levels to perform site level monitoring, coaching and management support to sites. Provincial and regional level support will transfer technical capacity and increase area of the specific support to service delivery sites. They can also coordinate for policy and higher level support from central government. This will be crucial for long term self sustainability. In country where the routine service at sites have been supported through national program, above site support will improve program service delivery quality, monitoring and evaluation activity and allow targeted program improvement where gaps are identified. It will broaden impact of health outcome at multi service delivery sites rather than just few PEFAR supported sites. The second is the PEFAR may provide more cross border or and technical exchange programs among regional countries to share lesson learned and maximize disease control prevention programs across nation. The third is the harmonizing MNE tools and definition of indicator from multi-donors and countries, such as the UNS Global Fund or other global organization. This minimizing, such as the use the same reporting system and reporting definition in order not to create in multiple data system for main traits. Main traits are the first one is the other comorbidity and mortality, such as the STI that is increasing epidemic and hepatitis or non communicable disease. This disease increased death rate in HIV patients. If we focus on integration and management of these comorbidity or mortality can support the maintenance of HIV epidemic control. The second threat is to uh, include the other emerging disease of pandemic. Far fund should allow contingency plan and budget to mitigate other health threats. Unlock far fund from only HVS can improve overall health outcome of people living with HIV. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chiwan Nan. So I'm going to move to Dr. Cordelia um, and looking from Uganda. As you looked at this vision 2025, um, is it aligned to this SDG and Global AIDS strategy is the draft uh, PEFA strategy, the goals and objectives, the priority areas for the program to address. From your perspective, are any things missing or is there any need for refinement? Dr. Cordelia, over to you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Kechi. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And um, my response, my quick response to the question would be that uh, overall, the five-year strategy is aligned uh, to SDG3. And uh, over the years that PEPFA has supported, we have seen uh, the, the trend within which it's moving and that uh, we are seeing um, mortality uh, going down and in infections uh, generally going down. So I think uh, the strategies that were laid out the specific goals and objectives uh, seem to be in line with uh, most of the countries that are being supported. However, in terms of uh, the areas that might need a bit of refining, uh, specifically around uh, objective objective one, which is uh, looking at uh, attaining the 95, 95, 95, uh, my opinion would be that uh, we need, uh, as PEPFA, to, uh, needs to clearly come out and talk about uh, addressing the social determinants 
that are affecting the, the HIV program and how clearly these are going to be addressed in the different in the different countries. It is somewhere there, probably implied, but the way uh, it's talked about probably from viral load, reducing new infections, I think uh, the, the, the writing and uh, the explicit uh, details on how social determinants are going to be addressed should clearly uh, should clearly come out. And this should actually link uh, to how we are going to empower uh, livelihood support uh, together with some of the models that are being proposed within the strategy, the models that are client-centered and integrating uh, that type of, uh, of models with improving uh, livelihood uh, support or addressing um, specific uh, key social determinants that we now know which are affecting uh, epidemic uh, control to be realized. But by and large, uh, I think um, the PEPFAS strategy is aligned and uh, towards 2030 to achieving uh, SDG3. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Claudilian. And Dr. Wale, just from your perspective, I, I think we have all agreed that we have the technical tools to end AIDS as a pandemic, but we know that inequities, stigma, discrimination, and ineffective policies make a collective job more difficult. What specific strategies should PEPFA pursue to better confront this challenge? Thank you, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Allow me to recognize the conveners of this uh, discussion and thank them for including Zambia to be part of this uh, panel. We feel that we need to first and foremost start by having strategies that aim at reducing social barriers. We need to think of ways and means of empowering communities of people living with HIV and AIDS. And in Zambia, we have a network of people living with HIV and AIDS, and these need to be supported with uh, resources on how best to manage their lives and support one another. Many times, people fail to continue with treatment because they are unable to provide basic needs for themselves. They are unable to provide transport to access services or indeed have food for them to be able to continue with the medication. For the youths who are a big risky group in my country, we need to find interventions that aim at strengthening youth support groups. For example, we have what we call the teenagerizer for both negative as well as positive uh, teens, including adolescents, who we can groom to be youth leaders in fighting stigma and discrimination in the area of HIV and AIDS. Economic empowerment, is another area that we need to look at and focus on for particularly adolescent girls and young women. These need to be supported with local income generating activities in order to socially and economically empower them. And by so doing, reduce on stigmatization and also other vices such as gender-based violence. For men and women who are living with HIV and AIDS, we need to strategically empower them with information on HIV so that they can work as champions for HIV and AIDS in the workplaces where they are working from. The area of policies is one where we need to come up with uh, favorable policies that address people living with HIV and AIDS in terms of social benefits, such as support with food packs, as well as transport in order 
to ensure that we retain them in care and achieve viral road suppression. Lastly, we also need to think about capacity building for both staff and community health workers in the area of COVID in order for them to be able to be prepared and respond to the next outbreak. Allow me to also quickly touch on how should PEPFA continue to leverage its platform for broader health outcomes. In this area, from our perspective, we would want to advise that there is need to focus on community-led interventions, such as community ART dispossession, and these could be undertaken through community-based organizations as well as volunteers, and in some cases, patients themselves. We also need to continue to provide and improve demand creation in the area of COVID vaccination to target the communities or our people who are living with HIV and AIDS. We also need to heighten the integration of HIV and AIDS services with outreach services such as PMTCT as well as maternal child health services. Lastly, we also need to empower our facilities so that we move towards provision of virtual capacity building programs and mentorship through provision of ICT equipment in all our facilities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wiley. That's, that's a really specific strategies that we think we should pursue. And I really agree with you. Um, I'm going to turn it back to other panel members and I would um, go to you, Dr. Alicia. You know, when Dr. Mack was speaking about the impact of COVID, you know, I think he really gave us a good picture of the impact in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm just wondering, you know, in from Jamaica and from the Caribbean perspective, can you reflect a little bit on that question, you know, how COVID, the short and long-term effects of COVID on the PEPFA program, how should PEPFA continue to leverage its platform for broader health outcomes? So, when we look at um, at the short term and long term effect of COVID-19, we have to look at the health systems that we have in place within countries. How is it we strengthen the health systems to respond to both COVID and HIV? Because in as it stands now, the focus is on COVID within the Jamaican setting and in all international countries as that is uh, the driving force for mortality at this time and how do we use COVID in a sense to ensure that we have our short-term goals at this point in time set towards managing both pandemics. We have to join both pandemics and a response to both pandemics because that is how we will ensure that that HIV will get the attention it needs within the COVID-19 pandemic as it stands. The five-year set of strategies set out, I think we need to look at it and break it up into what is attainable within a global emergency versus what will be challenging to attain in terms of, of supply chain issues in terms of social context, in terms of how exactly is a country aligned and able to, to actually respond to public health emergencies. Because within, those con within that context, you then will be able to look at setting your short and long-term goals. 
because the effects are going to be there. Um, we, we don't know exactly how large scale it will be, because if you look at the, the COVID-19 pandemic, I don't think many of us thought that we'd be sitting here with masks and um, not being able to do many things as we would have in response to one, one, um, one viral illness. We thought that HIV would have been our biggest challenge. Now we have COVID-19 coming and coming to the forefront of everything. And we have to ensure that with COVID-19 coming to the forefront, HIV is not put on the back burner or further on the back burner within the existing health systems and health response within our countries. So in terms of mitigating the effects, we have to ensure that we're flexible in our approach, flexible in terms of things that we have put in place to attain in country settings. Can the country attain those things with the uh, with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. When we have certain surges within the COVID-19 pandemic, how is it that we're going to ensure that our prevention activities are being done? How is it that we're going to ensure that persons are still being able to access care? And we have to ensure that we are flexible in how we implement those activities. So it's flexibility in planning, flexibility in execution, and twinning both both epidemics together so that we can um, address them at the same time and not leave either one behind in the process. Over. Thank you so much, Dr. Alicia. That's, that's very helpful. And um, you know, I want to just at this point thank all the panel members for your contributions, for your reflections. It'd be very valuable because, you know, we know as PEPFAR, we cannot walk alone and we need the collaboration and partnership of our government partners. So getting your reflection on the strategy is really important and we are very appreciative of your contribution. So I'm gonna turn it now over to my colleague, uh, Mai, to go ahead and moderate the Next, the question and answer section. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kechi, and a big thank you to all of our panelists. We are now going to open up uh, the session for discussion. We have uh, just about 20 minutes, uh, and we really welcome remarks from uh, our participants at this stage. Uh, and maybe just in terms of the process, um, we are uh, opening uh, uh, comments both verbally and then also within the chat. You could paste your comment in the chat. But if you would like to make uh, any uh, comments verbally, please uh, raise your hand and then we will uh, go through uh, in sequence uh, uh, those for those participants who'd like to make uh, comments. Uh, so I think our panelists have set the stage for a great discussion. You can uh, choose to build on comments, um, uh, include your own specific feedback for your countries, uh, but please uh, go ahead. So just confirming, uh, maybe David, uh, also with you on your screen that we are not seeing any raised hands at this stage. Uh, do we have any raised hands? Thank you. Uh, George, we have a raised hand. You can go ahead. Great, thank you. Sorry, it's an error. Oh, okay. All right. Any comments from our participants? I see a comment from Antonio Konji, Kenya. Maybe he might want to read it out. Okay, uh, please go ahead. 
sure. Um, thank you very much uh, uh, for this opportunity and for um, moderating this session. Uh, I think key for me, um, what I have noted is just how much pressure, um, especially COVID has put on existing health infrastructure and health personnel. So much so that countries that already were um, teetering on the brink of collapsing and uh, the impact of um, of COVID have faced a rough time. And this isn't an emergency that they expected would continue for a year plus. Um, so thank you very much for um, for having this session so we can make our, our presentations. What there seems, what is happening right now is because of the shortage of staff um, and even with the community health workers who are uh, pretty much overwhelmed, at least in the areas that we work in, um, for example, in Pisco, Kenya, they will need to put in um, resources um, because we realize that infrastructure might not necessarily expand as fast as uh, community health workers might need. So our best bet will be to continue to support health workers, but also generate um, another generation of community health workers who can support in the instances where we have similar epidemics. But remember when you have such epidemics, it also takes away from HIV and AIDS intervention. So which means we, we lost out on trained community health workers who have gone into emergency interventions for, for COVID. Um, so the our strategy should start looking at how um, to make sure that other epidemics uh, or pandemics such as COVID do not take away from the fight against HIV. And mostly people become complacent when you feel like you've probably figured out HIV and AIDS interventions and, and, and therefore we should let you know, other things take their course. But the reality is we are not yet out of the woods with HIV. Um, and the fear that any other new epidemics might take away from existing infrastructure, um, personnel, and, and financing is really a threat that we must watch out for. And we must also not forget that while some countries uh, listen to a lot of examples from South Africa and just how much resources they have, while some countries might have an easier time transitioning uh, from PEP for funding or U.S. government funding to their uh, country funding, some countries will still be much, much slower um, in, in, in allocating budgets uh, for health and especially HIV and AIDS. So our strategies should focus on, on improving on what we already have and making sure that we don't lose out in the little that we have in terms of resources, financial, technical, infrastructure, and all that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Anthony, for those comments. And I think very much uh, uh, highlighting some issues for Kenya and the challenges that we've experienced over the past uh, year and a half now, uh, both in terms of sustaining services and planning going forward for uh, addressing both uh, epidemics. Um, okay, let's see if we have any other uh, questions from our participants. a question in the chat from Maxwell Marks. Maxwell, would you like to speak? Sure. Um, thank you very much, uh, Anjali and the team, um, and also the countries that have actually made the presentation this afternoon for us, uh, morning for you all. Um, I think as you've heard from uh, Okonji, the, the interesting part is that we have uh, all the countries talking about uh, the whole issue around um, transitions. And so I'm wondering how we could uh, really help articulate and work with count, uh, with the different countries and host governments in really making sure that we do capture those processes within our strategic plan, because those conversations, as we all know, are not going to happen overnight. Uh, the elections happening, the changes in regime, uh, but we know the technocrats do remain still. But then again, We've heard from different countries in different conversations, even through the SFI, that uh, we need to stagger these conversations over time. It needs to engage not only the government, uh, it has to engage different stakeholders, development partners, and more so the community. So the question is, how do we um, get guidance from the countries on ways to 
better engage the PEPSO teams with some clear expectations from their ends <clears throat> and perhaps different timelines, but in terms of just maybe a standardized approach um, that involves not only the Ministry of Health, we have Treasury and other even county governments in different countries where we have devolution as a system of governance. So for me, I think it's critical to hear from the stakeholders how we as PEPFA can be better placed to support them in our transition engagements over the period of time and how that can be reflected in our document going forward. And finally, two key elements that I think we need to also emphasize is the Global Fund has made some progress and other countries have done some good work in aligning data, presentation, budgeting processes with the different countries' fiscal policy and budgeting timelines. Uh, for PEPFA, we do our, uh, you know, with the US government, we have October 1 to September. And so that always remains a challenge in terms of how we align our resources, which are availed through uh, the Congress, but also how do we then better align our data reporting? So the ports do occur different times. Uh, countries have different uh, uh, quarterly meetings on presenting national data and different stages of uh, progress reports. So how do we align our fiscal and program data uh, processes uh, within this new strategy and how do we work towards a common uh, uh, timeline that would then put us in sync with the country and host governments. Over. Great. Thank you so much, Maxwell, uh, for, for those comments. Okay, I see we have a hand up from uh, Tapiwa Tarambiswa. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you so much, um, May and Angelina and the team. Um, I'm Tapiwa from the Minister of Health, Lesotho, and just sort of to pick up on Max's point, um, how do we um, work together to begin the discussion on transition, which is very important. I think with our PEPFA team in Lesotho, we've done quite a lot of um, commendable work with them. Um, but now I think it's time we start shifting the gear towards the discussion on transition. Um, the governance end of it. Um, how do we set up technical working group or committees that are, you know, assigned to sort of discuss issues of transition, be it service delivery, human resource for health, um, health information systems, etc. And these technical working groups should not just be your Ministry of Health, like Max has said, Ministry of Finance, Public Service in our case, um, the Global Fund, PEPFA, the civil society um, and other line ministries that are important. So having that forum where the governance end of issues, um, the conversation begins because um, a lot of work has been done. And um, as funding starts to reduce across the portfolio, PEPFA Global Fund, it shocks the government. Our financial years are not aligned, et cetera. And so until we start having this forum where all stakeholders are together, and we start to discuss, okay, in the next five, 10 years, what are the plans? How are we going to transition? What is the model going to look like, et cetera? I think we need to start there. And that is the recommendation in response to um, Max's point um, in terms of what do stakeholders recommend? That's us from the suit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. And I do think one of the goals of this next phase of PEPFAR is to do more to focus on transition needs, transition planning, and I think absolutely improve uh, uh, engagement with our government counterparts on all of those pieces. And I think you noted multiple areas um, from a technical standpoint, but also in terms of the stakeholders on the ground that we need to make sure to be bringing in all of those voices. So thank you so much for those comments. Okay, so uh, any other uh, participants who would like to raise their hands uh, and, and make uh, any comments? Thank you. And are there any additional chats in the chat box that we may have missed? Uh, nothing in the chat, Mai. Nothing in the chat. Okay. So we have uh, quite a few participants on the line. Um, so maybe just want to encourage uh, folks to speak up if they'd like to say something.
And I also wonder, sorry, this is Anjali, um, if we want to also go to the panelists, I know you were only able to reflect on one, maybe two of the questions. If there are other questions that I know you thought about, but perhaps want to reflect on as well, we would welcome that. And uh, Mai and Keiji, if you'd be open to facilitating that piece, that would be great as well. Yes, yeah, sure, Anjali, that sounds good. Um, do you, any of our panelists want to go to any of the questions that they have not yet had a chance to respond to? All right, I'm not seeing uh, any raised hands. Uh, Kitchi, anything in the chat? Um, I don't want to put the panelists on the hotspot, but you know, I think Max um, raised some points um, for the panelists, and I was just wondering, you know, if they had some reflections on what he had um, asked. And if not, that's fine as well. Again, we really appreciate all this feedback. Um, we'll have more opportunities online for additional inputs. But I wonder then, um, Bill, if you'd like to just summarize some of the key themes that we've heard uh, for folks and um, and close us out. All right. Thank you, Angelique. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's really. Um, uh, a lot of of a lot of really important and insightful points, and I'm really uh, glad to be part of this conversation. Um, my job is really to try to summarize some some high points, uh, not to summarize everything. So if I missed something, uh, just be reassured that it will be noticed because the entire session's being recorded, as well as in the chat box and and. Um, for someone who has ideas after the end of this session, there will be other opportunities to um, to to contribute to um, to strengthen the five year strategy. But um, I'm personally grateful to the panelists and the and the facilitators this morning because it was really really rich and um, and and a lot of important points were made. I'm going to do my best to touch on some high points. Uh, we started with Dr. Alicia Rob Allen from Jamaica and and really uh, a strong focus on the country context of each of our um, each of the countries where we're achieving epidemic control uh, policies, culture, vulnerabilities, social context, um, but also the importance of the client being a key participant in the response. Um, the 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 attention to a holistic approach and a collaborative approach um, really came through in those comments, and I thought that was a th th those were very important. Dr. Dr. Rose, um, uh, the key observations about the strategy: one is that we really need to hold ourselves accountable for evidence base and evidence driven strategies including um, really relying on, on local evidence uh, to, dr to drive the interventions that, that, that we include in the strategy. Um, also important was the local context. And, and as we um, engage communities, empower communities, view the community as pivotal in the response to hold ourselves accountable to the government and how the government visualizes the sustained epidemic control um, this includes attending to social determinants. Um, uh, strengthening community systems uh, as and local partners and public private partnerships again needs to fit into a to an overall um, government 
vision and visualization of, of how sustained epi epidemic control uh, looks. And key populations, um, this is uh, an important observation that we define key populations the same across all countries, but some countries have additional highly vulnerable populations that really need that extra um, attention uh, to the determinants of the, the and barriers to their health uh, and their success in, in, in epidemic control. Threats to epidemic control, um, uh, decrease in funding or really spreading the funding in a way that loses focus, um, really making sure that we maintain a, a, a monitoring and evaluation system and view this as a public health effort, um, uh, integrated service delivery. Um, and I think this is a key point that we've been, we've been uh, uh, talking about quite a bit is as people live with HIV, live longer, we need to address the comorbidities and the infrastructure required to serve them um, and, and keep them not only alive from HIV standpoint, but, but healthy. Um, Mark from South Africa, really uh, uh, important observations about the, the massive impact of COVID and how it is uh, really important to consider bringing the uh, HIV response and the COVID response into the same conversation because of the of the of the massive um, impact of of COVID. Um, Dr. Chiwanan from Thailand, uh, some really key points. One was really as we get closer to epidemic control, moving the focus from the sites to the systems that support the sites the coordination, oversight, monitoring, and evaluation, um, and harmonizing our indicators and tools across donors, uh, as well as addressing comorbidities among HIV. Um, again, I think a, a, a recurring theme is, is to be able, in the HIV response, to address other health emergencies. Um, Dr. Cordelia, um, Really important point that we that we are consistent about language and intention with regard to the social determinants of health. So that in our in our strategy we imply it, but um, it's important to be explicit and to address issues like livelihood support, and, um, and to really design our strategy to impact the social determinants. And then Dr. Mwale, um, really addressing inequities and having strategies that reduce social barriers, including empowering communities, but also really addressing the building blocks of economic security um, and economic empowerment. I have more, more notes. There are at least a couple of note takers. Um, and as I said, there's, there's, um, there's, there's a recording. So I'm sure that I've, I've, I've missed some things, but I just wanted to highlight those, um, uh, those pieces because of, because they were they stood out to me as a as an individual here at SCAG. So um thank you all for participating. Um thank you for listening. Thank you for engaging on this high, really important strategy. Uh thank you for your continued partnership in the in, in in PEPFAR. And do I turn it back over to somebody? Katie, sure. you want you want to sign us out, Katie? Just to join my thanks, I think you've said it's all, Bill. And thank you to everyone. And thank you to our rich um, feedback, the rich feedback we got from our panelists and others on the, the participants that also had um, to share with us. And um, that's that will be my concluding remarks. Thank you. And please continue to send us your feedback by email. Um, we would really like to hear from everyone. And over to you, Anjali. No, that's it. Just thank you very much. Please stay well, please stay safe. And we look uh, forward to continuing to work together with all of you. Again, the partnership is critical. So uh, please take care and thank you very, very much for contributing today. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.